Today's guest is Robert Belland. Here's our job talk about audiovisual communications. Welcome to the Job Talk podcast, where we talk with people who love their jobs. Our guests open up about their challenges, surprises, and secrets to success in their industries. Through conversation, we explore their careers, past work experiences, and the education that got them to where they are now. I want to jump right into this podcast, taking you back in time to when you were in grade 12 and you were graduating from high school. Um, What kind of student were you and did you have any idea of what you were going to do in life after you left high school? In grade nine and 10, I thought I was going to be an architect. I was pretty set on drawing drawing buildings and designing uh, houses. I looked at magazines that had houses. I used to draw houses. I was a little bit of an artist, and I really liked the idea of designing people's homes. And then by grade 11, I started working at a real Canadian superstore in the photo department, which was a crazy, amazing job, uh, developing photos when, when we still used to film to take pictures. And a girl I worked with had a dad that was an architect, and she kind of like, I just picked her brain about uh, architecture. And she said that, uh, you know, it doesn't pay that well. (laughs) Her dad makes like an average income and he works really hard. She said the only way to make really good money as an architect is to um, make enormous buildings and make a lot of them, like to be the head of a really big construction firm or something. And it, it had no, I had no interest in that. By the time I graduated grade 12, I kind of got the sense that architecture wasn't for me, but maybe something creative like um, something to do with video, something to do with computers, or maybe something artistic like just being an artist. So uh, to answer your question, when I graduated, I thought I was going to maybe just be an artist somehow. And I had had already mapped out going to a college. Red Deer has a – I grew up in Red Deer. It has an amazing college. uh, Red Deer College is an amazing art school. And – and yeah, and as a high school student, I was average. You know, if I liked a course, I'd get an A. If I had no interest, I would just barely pass, pretty much. We had a class called VizCom, I think, which was just drawing and taking photos and like video editing. And I aced that course. I was fantastic at it. And then I barely passed like uh, social studies and English, you know, the important humanity skills, human skills. But the earth skills I did great at. So I, I don't know how you'd how you'd rate me as a student when you were graduating from high school uh how are you feeling were you panicking about i need to decide what i'm going to be doing right away because i kind of have that personality where um i just immediately panicked i didn't know what i wanted to do but how were you feeling were you excited (laughs) uh yeah i i had fallen in love with a girl from superstore her name was veronica And she had her whole life mapped out, like meticulously. It made me feel completely unprepared. And so um, I tried to get in. I actually tried to get into a college in Vancouver called Emily Carr, which is a super um, art, like fancy, well-known art school, I think. At least it seemed like it was back then. And they were having none of me. I went, I even went there and did an interview and they're like, "Eh." like, I didn't have any art portfolio at all. So of course they didn't uh, take me. And so my backup plan was Red Deer College. And uh, instead of just going to college like I should have, I took a full year to just upgrade my classes because all my my, um, grades were average, you know, because I just didn't care at all in school. I just really liked doing the things I liked doing. So I took a year to just upgrade my math, my my, – just all my grades. So I took a full year of just taking – it was like basically an extended high school year because I was – I don't remember being scared to go to college, but that was, I was making an excuse to not go to college. But no, I didn't really, once I decided to go to Rager College, I was 100% excited, had no more worries or fears. Um, It was just, I was just excited because it was just playtime, a full two year, I think it was a uh, degree. I can't remember. I only did one year anyways. I did a full year at Rager College of painting, um, art history, drawing, um, ceramics, uh, three-dimensional design. It was great. It, it was, I had no, I woke up every day excited to go to school. It was great. So it was, I guess, completely opposite of you. 
<laughs> that's good. That's that's healthier. Uh, that's a healthier approach. Um, you know, I have a question about your upgrading. So, what what is it like when you you've um, you're a little bit older and you go back to upgrade? Are you are you taking it more seriously? I did two things. First of all, I went to a Catholic school when I went to high school in Red Deer. And when I graduated and upgraded, I went to a non-Catholic school to upgrade. So I, nobody knew me. And I, so I fit right in. It was just, I was just a nobody. I, I made no friends there somehow. And um, I didn't really try that much harder because I, all I did was take all the same courses I already took. Like Chem 30, I must have had like a 70 going in. When I upgraded, I came out with like an 85. I basically just got 80s and above on, in everything after that. Cause that's why I went in there. But as long as I got 80, I didn't care. Like I wasn't trying to get nineties. So yeah, I didn't need to do any of the upgrading. Art school doesn't care anyways. Like, it was <laughs> <Yeah>. stupid. <laughs> okay. There's it was, it was a waste. So we'll, we'll fast forward to um, now because I know you, I know you went to McEwen university in Edmonton. Uh, so you got into the audiovisual communications program there. Uh, could you tell me a little bit about your time at McEwen and how that kind of, added to your interest in media work. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to give you one side story from my art school. I don't even know how I managed this. I didn't have a car or anything, but my mom did. And so I bust to college all the time. It was no big deal. But uh, one of our projects was this really, they, they wanted you to go home and make a three-dimensional thing. So I had spent like a four-day weekend building this um, beautiful three-dimensional, inside of a three-dimensional building. It was just basically architecture and with stairs and walls and light and lighting and stuff. And it was meticulously made and it was about, you know, like uh, three feet by three feet cubed. It was pretty big. And instead of just getting my mom to drive me to school, I took this thing on the bus. So try to imagine middle of winter, <laughs> like this, the most delicate <laughs> building. And no one knows why I have this thing, right? Like I looked ridiculous and I got on the bus. And I had no concern about it. And thinking about it today, I would be all like nervous and embarrassed or whatever. But in, in college, I didn't give a crap. I just took up two seats, had this building with me, bust it to college. <laughs> and I just remember thinking about it recently, laughing at how hard that must have been. Did you get um, it there safely? Yeah, it was fine. Okay. I just, I must have did that all the time. I, I had no problems with it. Um, Sorry, what was your question about? <laughs> so yeah, we tell us a little bit about your experience taking audiovisual communications at McEwen University. Right. So uh, somewhere along the lines, I realized uh, I'm not going to make any money as an artist either. So I sidestepped. Also, the girl I was in love with had moved, was moving to Edmonton to go to university. So this is why I went to Edmonton, uh, Grant McEwen. And so I decided. Well, I always liked in high school. I always liked video production. Maybe the video production course at Grant McEwen is going to be really, is up my alley. And it was, it was perfect. So uh, the two year program at, at Grant McEwen was called audio visual communications. Same one you took, obviously. So I'm kind of telling you everything you already know. And uh, we learned um, video production, audio production, um, photography, advanced photography. Um, gosh, I don't know. We, they start web was really new back then. So we learned some web development. Uh, print was really good. We learned print production. And uh, it was the it was like being in my favorite class in high school, where I liked almost every class. I never worried about my grades because um, you just had to get the projects done. You didn't have to be a genius. And I just was really I had an aptitude for all the things in the class, so I found it really fun. And it was funny to me when I would see students that were stressed out about everything. I also this is back like oh gosh ninety six seven is that what it was. And um, uh, I didn't have a computer at home, so we had to use the computer labs at school. And they had really good apples back then. And you had to reserve one-hour blocks in the computer lab. I think you got two hours a day or something. I can't remember what the limit was in, in room 266. And, uh, and the people that were rich enough to have computers just could work at home on their projects all the time. And I was so jealous of that. And I didn't have a computer at home. So I would have to book these two hour slots. And if you didn't get your project done in the two hours of that day, you're just screwed. And the library had also computers you could book. So it, most of my time at Grant McKeon was scheduling, was making friends with enough people that had their own computers that I could then sign in 
their name at the computer lab and then use their two hour period. So you people would, <laughs> what was hilarious was I, people liked me enough that they weren't upset. So a student would be coming into the 266 lab at 9 a.m. stressed out. I'd be in there working. And then they would swing by at lunch to pick up their friend and I'd still be in the lab and they'd be confused how I could still be in there. But because but because I helped enough people with their computer projects, no one kicked me out. I was able to slide under the radar, whereas other people who overstayed their welcome would get narked and like tossed. I can't remember anyone whose name would do that, but I always remember uh, seeing someone get kicked out of the lab and I would pull my hoodie over my head and slink in the back because I'd always have the computer in the farthest back. Um, anyways, my time at Grandma McKean was fantastic. I really liked it. I, it, it was really my cup of tea, it turns out. You took it too, so you must have yeah, I was one of the I was one of the stressed out students uh, <laughs> that, you know, shocking um, as I yeah. tried to put my plan together. Um, so you graduate from McEw McEwen. Uh, what happens when you graduate uh, from McEwen? Where do you go? Yeah, so I was still trying to figure out what my career was going to be. I wasn't stressed hard about what I wanted to do for work. I just figured since I like doing, when I graduated, I ended up being really good at um, um, CD-ROM programming. So CD-ROMs were kind of the thing back then. This is before we had like real easy mobile media, like hard drives, external drives and stuff. We had um, uh, uh, zip drives and jazz drive. A jazz disc fit in a jazz drive. It fit a whole gig. It was the biggest drive imaginable. They were really expensive. But mostly people use zip zip drives, and they held like 200 megs. And we would copy files to it, and it would take like uh, 40 minutes to copy <laughs> the 200 meg file. It was a stressful time. We had to burn CDs, uh, one times burn, two times burn. And uh, God, that what a memory remembering how media has come since The that. technology, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyways, I really uh, did well with CD-ROM programming. So as soon as we graduated... I started, I didn't really look, I don't remember looking for a job. Um, I was networking already though. So I had made friends with one of the instructors, Bob Lyce, and he, he worked at a place downtown called Digital North and Digital North was like a conglomeration of little independent companies who were sharing a space, the expenses of a rental space. So I think there was like six companies and they were just sharing all the pricing and Bob was in there and he was a CD-ROM programmer and he, he worked. Um, in a program called Macromedia Director, heavily back then. Macromedia made uh, Flash, and I, I'm not sure what they're doing these days. And so I could, I was really good at programming, so I ended up, right after graduating, there was a posting on the wall in the hallway at Grand McEwen from a accounting instructor who wanted to do a CD-ROM for his accounting course to help promote his accounting course. Now, accounting is boring and you either know that you want to be an accountant or you don't so making a cd-rom is not going to suddenly get him students however they had like um a budget to pay for a student that was graduated me for like a summer like four months and i can't remember what the pay was it was it was great though and so for the whole summer i worked i continued to work at the college for the accounting program building the cd-rom and it was <laughs> I wasn't a designer, it turns out. Like, I didn't have the graphical design <laughs> skills to make it something that was technically useful. So I just made it kind of, like, artsy and fancy, and, and it was not that functional. And then I had to um, show it with this instructor to his um, his board to help promote this CD-ROM to students. But the when I, I just remember leaving the meeting after showing it to everybody realizing they have they're gonna have no need for what they just paid me to make <laughs> that and must I have been a very fulfilling <laughs> fulfilling feeling hey yeah it's really sucked because uh <laughs> it wasn't that great and i felt bad for the instructor because he had spent all this money on me um but i ended up getting more little jobs like that um with bob at digital north he he hired me to come in and help him with some stuff at like 15 bucks an hour and um I did that for two or three months and it was fine. I liked going downtown and, and programming and stuff, but it didn't like the 15 bucks an hour was kind of fine, but it was low end. Like he was making 60. I met a bunch of guys that were making hundred dollars an hour as programmers. And, um, 
And coincidentally, right as I had a conversation, because I said I sat Bob down. I'm like, you know, the fifteen dollars an hour is is not quite cutting it. Can we renegotiate? And he's like, no, that's the most I'm ever going to pay. You. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah, because he's like, you're just doing the work I don't want to do. Yeah. Um, but if you want to do heavier programming stuff, I could pay you more. But it would have to be project uh, dependent. And right yeah. at the exact same time, um, Nate. Northern Alberta Institute of Technology. I think they're just called Nate now. I don't know if they they're a, they used to be a tech yeah. institute. Are they still a tech institute? I can't remember. I think the department was digital media production, and they uh, they were just kind of a new department. Um, learning resources or something. It was part of they they had a small department that was managing the the, the I don't know what to call it. And the institute they had projectors and slide projectors and, and stuff like that that was being managed. But they were trying to develop a multimedia arm of it digital media yeah so i kind of got right in there right when they started the the department so i got lucky and soon after they hired you as well so that's a nice coincidence this was around 1999 yeah 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 and uh, it was exciting to get a real job for like a real place yeah that makes sense yeah because i had been doing like subway and then the bay christmas department and then like you know I had a hundred different jobs long before uh, I got to Nate, but when I when I did that first stint at Grand McEwen doing the CD round programming, that felt like a real my first real kind of adult job, yeah. which felt great. And then working with Bob at Digital North felt like a real adult job. And then getting an actual salary position at, at Nate was amazing. And so I didn't even plan any of that. I was just working. Um, I was just doing the kind of work I really liked doing, and I was lucky enough to have networked with other people in the industry so that when they needed someone with my skills, they called me up. So I kind of, it kind of all fell together without a lot of forethought. Yeah. So I, I guess I was lucky that way. I'll, I'll kind of gloss over your long career at Nate, um, but um, what, what was your, what did your role end up being for the majority of uh, your time at Nate? And, uh, we'll get into what you're doing now and maybe we can talk about, you know, what you learned from your time at Nate going into your new venture. Yeah. Um, uh, so at Nate, I started as like, um, uh, an every man, like I had all these kind of AV skills. So I was kind of filling in all the needs of the new department. So if there was some, some easy web stuff that needed to be done, I would do it. If there was some easy, um, video stuff, I would do it. Video graphics, um, when you came in, you were the you were video, you were the video department all by yourself pretty much. So I was pretty much became your support guy. If you needed some af some emotion graphics, I would give you a hand, or you know whatever. I was kind of supporting different depart different things. Um, my focus at the very start was programming, um, and programming direct director. So director was the software back then. So programming CD-ROM stuff that we were doing at Nate programming some uh, animation stuff for the website. Uh, Nate had a full web team, so they didn't really need web development outside of like videos and animations and um, motion graphics. So that's kind of the stuff I was doing. And just slowly as the department grew, um, there was a need for a supervisor position, which I, I applied for, I stepped into. And then my role kind of changed from being specific to, because CD-ROM programming kind of phased out anyways. So that was kind of a benefit to me. So then I just kind of became a supervisor slash support to the different uh, team members. Um, and I, I did that for like, uh, I think 14 years. I'd have to yeah. look at the numbers, but a long time. And it was great. I mean, the work, the what I liked the most about the work was um, I liked doing different things all the time. I liked doing some web development and then I liked doing some animations and then I liked doing... Uh, CD-ROM, and then I like doing um, video animations for you. I like doing all the different creative things. Um, some of the stuff was stressful. Like you and I would do uh, the sport, uh, the Nate Athletic Awards show in the Shaw Theater. That was stressful to me. The live stuff always kind of stressed me out because we did it so irregularly, and it seems like such a high um, chance of failure. That, that that kind of stuff always made me nervous. Um, but yeah, I think what I liked most about Nate was the people, working with people, the coffee breaks, the 
like the the um, socializing, and the and because the work I did was was wasn't that um, stressful, it was a a pretty good job. Um, yeah, I was. So I didn't really. I was completely stressed out the whole time at Nate. So <laughs> there there you see the difference in yeah. our personalities again. Is, it is a personality thing. I think. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. I want to, so we, we have the career at Nate. Um, you're an entrepreneur, you leave Nate and, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the company you're running right now? Um, and then we'll get into that a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, when I near my end of time at Nate, I was, um, living with uh, a woman who had a, her own kind of career. She started working at Nate as well. And then she left was doing her own thing and we had double income we had our own house no kids and so i could afford to kind of um to leave nate to do some side projects i was working on and the side projects didn't pay that well at first but because i didn't need the money as well i was in a safe place to kind of to leave and i always wanted to leave um i always wanted to do my own thing because i i didn't like the one thing i didn't like at nate and i think this is everywhere that like institutions is the multi-layer of um, of management over me making decisions that I didn't always agree with, and I hated not having that kind of control. So uh, the entrepreneur in me wanted the control of running my own business, so I ended up taking the chance to leave Nate and running. Um, at that time, I was running web sites for a property management company in Vancouver, and we, they had a lot of them, so um, it, uh, financially it paid well. And um, I'm trying to remember even what I did because I, I left Nate like how many years ago now? Uh, 10? Yeah, something like that. What is it? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So probably 10 years ago. The first five years was easy because I had a client I didn't have to find. I already had them and they were paying all my bills and I just made them, kept them happy. And it wasn't a lot of work. It was like a couple hours a day at the most. Easy, simple life. And, um, and then, and then my business, what happened? Oh, I got divorced. <laughs> I got two, like two things happened at once. I got divorced and my big client said, oh, we, we don't want to use you anymore. So we're going to phase you out over the next oh, that, That's great so, timing. Oh, it was so stressful. So yeah. I like, I, I, uh, I had to afford suddenly to buy my own house, which I did. And then I had to, um, replace all of my income because my current income was disappearing yeah so that was a stressful transitional period where i had to figure out what other work i could do because the web stuff i was doing i just lucked upon i didn't really earn it like i didn't develop a foundation and then build all these clients it was just one client so like, like as an entrepreneur having one source of income is real risky which <laughs> you know just bad it's uh, not a world i want to occupy but <laughs> it's stressful yeah yeah and so at that very same time, I had a friend who was running like a small AV service for one big client. He was providing them with the audio video support for their seminars. They were doing like 80 seminars a year. And he went and bought all the equipment and was just running their AV equipment, the speakers, the microphones, the projectors, the PowerPoints. And he just ran all their shows for a bunch of years. And he was the stress of running live shows for someone was whittling him down. And he wanted to buy a house. So he didn't like he felt too uncomfortable. So he offered to sell it to me. So I, I said, like, sure. Okay. So I ended up taking on a bunch of business debt to uh, buy the equipment and then take over as a client. And I had all the skills, thankfully, from my years at Nate of, you know, running projectors, running a PowerPoint, managing, you know, managing the AV is, is pretty simple. And, um, my business kind of, I started to d expand my business services. So I was going from my web stuff was dropping dramatically. And then this uh, live event service was growing. And so I built a website. I, I, I um, built a new company name called Seminar Tech Services, which just means I provide tech services for your seminars, basically. Yeah. And I had one client. That was it. <laughs> yeah. And I did the same thing where all my income was one client. And uh, it was paying my bills great. And it was work that I, that I was stressed was going to be hard. But after like five live shows, it wasn't stressful anymore because everything became kind of predictable. And uh, I did that for like two years. And then, so 2019, so started 2020, uh, COVID hit. 
Yeah. And all live events stopped. <laughs> Which is the worst? Uh, I was going to ask. I was going to ask. Actually, <laughs> we were going to go into uh, how the pandemic affected you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's and, you know it affects different companies different ways. And my company was so heavily reliant on live events that all my business completely failed, like just disappeared. My clients, I, you know, my my sixty shows a year uh, became zero. So uh, I was. Like, I'm, I, I saw that as a problem I had to solve right away. So what I did was I, I assumed the pandemic would probably take two years. So I, um, I, sold, I immediately sold my house. I sold my extra vehicle, sold half the stuff I, at my house I didn't really need because I was downsizing. And I just found a really cheap, um, affordable apartment. With, and I took my three elderly, um, immortal cats <laughs> and all of all of the stuff that fits in a house, I squeezed it into a two bedroom apartment, and I've just been living as cheap as possible for two years off of just savings basically and and um and immediately needed to diversify and so the I have all these a v skills so the what i um did was I immediately expanded my services to live streaming because I just assumed live streaming was going to be this huge people were going to need it and uh so i bi I built a website. Well, I already had like seminar techs, but I built a whole new web page for live streaming. And then I paid um, an SEO expert. I have a friend that happens to be one. I threw a bunch of money at SEO because I knew I needed to rank well in, in town because it was I was brand new to it. And I didn't know how long it would take, but it took a month. That was it. And I was immediately the first result in live streaming. Amazing. Because uh, people just weren't taking live streaming that seriously in the in town. So it was easy to outrank people really fast. Um, in Edmonton. Yeah. Now I, I can't outrank uh, people in Canada cause there's a lot of really big companies, but, uh, that was probably the f best thing I did was rank f fast. Um, cause it usually takes months to kind of slowly rank up and it's expensive. And, uh, you know, live streaming didn't take off for me right away. It took like a year somehow before I started to get traction on it. Yeah. And, uh, I know why, I think, because I reached out to every church and a funeral home. That was the first groups I thought would need live streaming. I reached out to every one of them. I made an Excel doc, and uh, I just emailed them. I didn't call them. I think that was the first mistake. And only, like, two people got back to me out yeah. of, like, 100 companies. And the first guy, he said uh, three words, our needs are met. That was his response. Our needs are met. Yeah, yeah he spelled yeah. it A R E. Yeah. Our needs are met. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, man. And, <laughs> and, um, it, like, why even reply if you're going to misspell it? But, anyways, what was funny about that guy is, uh, like, four weeks later, a family found me online, thanks to my SEO, and hired me to do a funeral at that guy's funeral home because the live streaming that they were doing was such poor quality, the client refused to use it. So they did you meet me. him? Did you literally meet nope. this guy? Never nope. met this guy. No. Oh, okay. No. I emailed yeah. him again after that, but he yeah. still didn't need me. Um, and uh, yeah, so I had a real bad pandemic year and a half, but um, slowly. Was, so all I did was kind of like uh, tread water. For, yeah. For like uh, fifteen months, and then this year September things started to open up again here in Edmonton, yeah. and and. Um, and once I started to do actual, like, uh, what would happen is over the last year and a half, um, people would slowly find me through the website, but it was very irregular. So uh, people that were planning their weddings, people that were planning their funerals, those were the two big live streaming things that, that I was uh, getting asked to quote on. And, um, and so I got work over the last year, kind of like doing weddings and funerals erratically you know a couple two three four a month and that's not really enough to pay the bills it's close but mm -hmm. it stopped me from just hemorrhaging savings you know yeah but um what really helped me out was um a, a couple things one i uh i know that word of mouth is really big when it comes to business uh, you know your business and and people recommending you to other people so I knew that customer service with every project I got was like the most important aspect of my business. I needed people to leave 
um, the event or whatever was going on, really happy with my services so that they'd recommend me to their friends and family. And that that uh, made it that helped a little bit with word of mouth. But once I started meeting funeral homes, because I would call, be called, I'd be hired by someone to go at a, to a funeral home and run a live service. The funeral home liked me enough to start recommending me. And that's when my business really started to recover. In September, I had been to enough funeral homes that they were starting to, what, what I discovered was, um, so t I did two things. One was I started getting um, referrals from fun funeral homes who really liked me. So um, my people skills played a big role. And number two, I, st I networked last year. I reached out to other videographers and other companies that were live streaming and tried to network with them so that if they needed support, they would think of me and so that they knew I existed. So I needed them to not see me as competition, but as like a support. And, and uh, because of those two things, I started getting referrals from other live streaming companies. There's a couple uh, here in town who are getting all of the funerals, which I didn't realize. And um, what would happen is the, new, the funeral home would then meet me and realize, oh, there's options. I don't have to just use this one company. Rob represents the second company. And I like Rob more than I like this other guy. <laughs> Like yeah. quality of service obviously matters. Like I give the best quality I can, but the other guy's great too, right? So we're both good at live streaming. Yeah. The only thing that's going to leave an impact is how the interaction of the family with me, the the funeral home with me. Um, and so yeah, so when September happened, uh, things opened up, and I started getting referrals. And I've been really busy ever since, thankfully, like the, mostly with funerals, to be honest with you. But uh, you know, two or three a week, and that for me, that's a lot. Yeah. Um, what, what do you like best about your job, do you think? Because uh, it's not just the technical skills that you have running these events. Uh, like you said, you have to have a certain amount of social skills to do it as well. What, what do you like best about what you're doing right now? Yeah. yeah you know, I'm meeting other live streaming companies or AV companies. It, it's a There's a real sp a particular um, personality type I've discovered. They're either really good with people and they manage a company and then they outsource all the tech work to tech nerds or they're a tech nerd that slowly <laughs> developed people skills. Yeah. If that makes sense. So cause yeah. those are just seems to be uh, the AV companies really draw tech nerds, people who really get into the minutia of, of audio video tech. It's a it. It's all nerds. And yeah. uh, it kind of takes a nerd because, you know, you have to be able to problem solve tech things all the time. And uh, I, I happen to be right in the middle of not being nerdy enough to know the difference between a, a dynamic mic and a, and a, a, I don't even know the name of the other one. That's how bad I am. But yeah. I can tell you what mics to buy because I, I do. What happens is the research is online, so I don't have to know it. I can just go look it up. And But I have the skill to use it and I have the skill to work with people. So yeah. I managed to get by not being as nerdy as the rest. But being a nerd really helps. I, I already forgot what your question was. Well, yeah, I was talking about the likes um, with what you're doing right now, but maybe we'll transition. Is there something that you don't like about what you're doing right now? Well, live streaming is stressful. Like anything that's live, you know, uh, it's your job to make it work. And when it doesn't work, it's your fault. Like it's your responsibility. Yeah. So there's that. Um, but being able to do it and like I really like helping um, – like when you shoot a, a live stream for a wedding or a funeral, there's people at home who couldn't get to go, who you're helping um, experience it. And so I get a real feeling of satisfaction helping, uh, you know, people in PEI who couldn't travel all this way for a funeral. They really appreciate being able to hear and see the funeral clearly. And it's the exact same thing with the wedding. Um, the difference between the wedding and the funeral is the wedding is more stressful because, um, uh, the bride and groom need it to look good because that's their expectations and grandma at home needs to hear it. And then funerals, um, there's just way less pressure for some reason. Yeah. Like it's just as hard as a wedding, but, uh, everyone is so grateful that it worked. Of course. <laughs> I think so many, so many people have experienced really bad live streaming or zoom calls and stuff. So the bar is so low yeah. that I can almost do nothing wrong. It's great. Okay, you mentioned that you um, noticed that when you were first starting to reach out to people, to potential clients, that you sent out emails um, and you felt that maybe that wasn't the best approach. 
Is there anything else that you wish you knew then that you do know now after running a business for the past three years and you ran a business during a pandemic? That's amazing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, good questions. Gosh. Um, yeah, like number one, I would have diversified my income better probably three years in advance. Yeah. So I was not aggressive at all at trying to find new clients because I had a big fat client paying all my bills for years. So yeah, I would have diversified where my money was coming from first. Second, I would have networked more right up front. Like my networking only kicked in last year probably. And I probably should have been networking five years ago with other AV companies. So that um, for a couple of reasons. One, when I have a project I can't do, I could give it to them. And when they have a project they can't do, they could have been giving it to me. That's kind of how it's been going recently where we'll be trading projects like I, I can't do two funerals at once, so I give all the extra funerals that I get requests for to uh, five other guys in my list. So yeah, I would have networked more. Um, I think a lot of guys, I think a lot of people in business will sometimes see um, other businesses that do the same thing they do as competition. However, um, it doesn't have to be like that. I feel like there's enough work for everyone. And the more you are willing to share the work, the more others are going to want to share it with you and can help you when you need it. Is there is there anything that I haven't asked you that you think you could offer some information to somebody interested in getting into what you're doing or maybe not necessarily streaming video and running media, but somebody starting a business? Is there anything that I, you know, missed ask asking you? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, running a business definitely takes a personality type that is not risk averse. So you have to be pretty comfortable balancing risk. And I like there was a lot of months where I had one month of savings in my bank account where if I made no money, I would be out of money in 30 days. That happened a lot. But uh, I survived it fine. I yeah. don't know. So I think it. it uh, yeah, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you kind of have to be. Um, and if you have a, uh, if you're not risk averse, then you have to map it out better than I did. Like just plan it out, diversify everything all at once, have a support structure like a partner that you live with that makes money, you know, find all the ways you can to give you uh, that safety net you need and then pick a pick um, the type of work that you enjoy getting up and doing when it's when you normally wouldn't want to like i do the live streaming stuff and the av stuff because i really enjoy that kind of work turns out and i really enjoy helping the kind of people that i help with when i live stream so it's not like it like i don't do a lot a lot of live streaming of really boring um accounting courses or anything like that like everything i'm doing keeps me really interested every time like every funeral is different every wedding's different and and so I have a personality that enjoys that stuff. So if you're going to start your own business, um, if your goal is just to make money, you're probably going to be a good manager, but you probably won't be good at doing the work. You're going to want to hire someone that that has a passion for that kind of work. But uh, some people have manager managerial uh, personality types, and that's perfect for them. Yeah, I don't know if that really answers your question, but it does. I think you've given great advice. I don't see the service that you offer going away anytime soon. So I think you're going to continue to see it grow and be That's successful great. with it. Yeah. I hope so, so Rob, you know what? I'd like to thank you for uh, joining us today. Um, and thanks for having me. Yeah, this has been great. Thanks a lot. Who doesn't like talking about themselves? I love it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Kim. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to the Job Talk podcast. For more information, please visit us at thejobtalk.com.